All right, welcome back to the Farmer Friday Call. My name is Jessica Nadd, and I am your host today. Uh, with me today, I've got my good buddy, Jimmy Emmons, and I've got my co-host, Drew Minnis, over in Lawrence, Kansas. Drew, how you doing? It's a fantastic Farmer Friday over here, Jess. It, Great to see it you. It is a fantastic Farmer Friday. I'm excited about the topics we're going to get started with. Um, and I will go ahead and share my screen, unless, Drew, you thought you could share on my behalf. Oh, he's got it for us. All right, so if you uh, go back to the very beginning, here, Drew, I'm going to have you unshare because those are Jimmy's slides. Okay. Um, well, <laughs> there we go. I think I was trying to share. Here we go. I got it. All right. So this is the fourth Farmer Friday that we've had over the last couple of weeks, and we have been greatly um, just blessed to be able to talk to some of our good buddies in agriculture. We kicked things off with Brandon Honeycutt up in Nebraska, and we spent a lot of time talking to him about some of the changes that he is seeing. Uh, we talked a little bit about National Corn Growers Association and the work that they're doing with the Climate Smart Commodities. Um, we talked a, a little bit about farmers for soil health and just what's a producer's perspective on getting into some of these topics. So that was great. We then transitioned over to Todd Tobin, um, who's another good good friend of mine. He's We've worked with Todd for over 20 years. He's in Pratt County, Kansas, um, just shy of about 7,000 acres. And he is doing soil health, regenerative agriculture at scale. Um, he talked a little bit on how producers can get started. What's the entry point? What are the pain points that he has seen? The reasons why he thinks doing um, demonstration plots and trialing products. He also does a lot of trials for prairie food. Um, so we just kind of talked a little bit about that mindset that he has gone through to make some changes. Last week, we had a lively conversation with Dale Strickler. Um, and, and basically, he was asking the question, he brought up the words that are sometimes difficult to talk about in agriculture, which are climate change. And he said, uh, he really weighed the pros and cons. You know, what are we going to do as an industry to to address some of the things that we're we're seeing with a changing climate, um, a very volatile economy? We've got global issues that are affecting us. And so he gave us he walked us through kind of a, a funny journey of what if we're right and what if we're wrong on this? So if you want to check out the replay, we've got all of those on our YouTube channel. They're already out and you can check them out. So today we're going to be talking to Jimmy Emmons. And then um, because based on some popular demand, we are going to keep going with our uh, Farmer Friday call. I always put this slide up here when you're at a party and no one wants to talk about soil health. I don't have that problem personally because any party I go to, I make it about soil health. I was actually out in Los Angeles um, last, last week and I got to talk to several inspirational women across the country and we learned about some amazing topics from um, women that were tackling issues of domestic violence and food insecurity um, and then we really, a lot of these issues do have a common denominator in ways that which we can all help as a, as a, a global society is, and that's taking care of our soil. So um, that was really fantastic. The Encore, next week, we're going to talk to Mark Heinz. He is one of our soil health agronomists. He has this amazing 35-year career and journey as a professional agronomist, and we're going to be talking about what has he seen in his life and in, and in his career that is now allowing him to devote the rest of his life and his career to tending to our soil? And then the week after that, uh, we'll be um, joined by Jamie and Marcus Richardson. They're producers out of Haven, Kansas. Jamie is on our soil and data team for Prairie Food. She has a fascinating um, technical background, and she uh, helps us analyze the results that we're seeing out in the field. But a Alongside that, her and her husband have also transitioned over to regenerative agriculture practices. So we're going to hear a little bit more about her journey and her story. Like I mentioned, Drew Minnis is my partner in crime. He's over in Lawrence, Kansas. We have our two soil sisters here on the picture with us. Um, the thing that I love about my job, I love the industry that I work in. I love the company that I work for. And I love the fact that um, 
my children get to see the work that we do. Um, they, I have taken my kids. If any of you have seen me at an event, it, it wouldn't be out of the ordinary to have one of my kids alongside me. We've been like that for years. I remember bringing a baby baby into uh, um, conferences that we've been to. So I'm blessed to be a part of this, this uh, industry and people that just support the working family. So I'm gonna quit talking here, but I have a few more slides that I always like to get to. What are we talking about here when we talk about soil, okay? I mean, every farmer knows about soil, of course. We know that that's our medium and how we grow things, but specifically, we get into the dirt or soil with regenerative agriculture and soil health um, practices. So I always bring up the principles. These are principles of soil health that guide decisions. Now, what I will say is that within each of these principles, there are several practices that a producer might uh, deploy for them to achieve a principle. So what Jimmy is doing down in Leedy, Oklahoma, may or may not be the same thing that Brandy, Brandon Honeycutt has the ability to do. The tools that Jimmy has might not be in Brandon's tool shop, right? So um, it's important to know that there's multiple practices, even in the state of Kansas, that you can do in the northeast part of the state that you're not going to be able to do in the southwest part of the state. So we're looking at keeping the soil cover, maintaining living roots all year round, uh, minimizing soil disturbance, integrating livestock, taking care of your underground livestock, your soil microbes, and maximizing um, your crop diversity. So that's really what we're talking about here. And I think, yep, got cover crops. Be a lot cooler if you did. Perfect segue to introduce my good buddy, Jimmy Emmons. Um, and I know he's got his own slides here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the share and we're going to introduce Jimmy Emmons. So Jimmy, welcome to Farmer Friday. Good afternoon, everyone. Glad to be here. Yeah, and I think you've done a few of these with us over the years. This isn't your first rodeo. <laughs> no, no, but it's always exciting and uh, I really enjoy uh, Farmer Friday and the knowledge uh, that we get out of that. Uh, you know, I've got to learn as much as anybody. So uh, it's really a good thing and I really appreciate the invitation to be here today. All right, Jimmy, well, I'm going to let you get things kick started here. Um, go ahead and get your slideshow going. But Jimmy and his wife, Ginger, down in Leedy, Oklahoma, um, several years ago, I was commissioned by a company to do an interview project. Jimmy was the very first farmer I ever got to interview. I showed up down at the, the house. We did a crop tour. We dug soil. And it was really uh, such an inspirational time that has led me, you know, I, I look up to Jimmy and he is, he is a mentor in the soil health space. So Jimmy, I will let you go ahead and take it away. Yeah. You know, like I said, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to kind of share my 13 year journey uh, down the soil health road and regenerative ag uh, road and a few milestones uh, that really changed the direction and accelerated where I went. Uh, you know, the old way on the left was the way I grew up with. Uh, is there a better way? I, I think we found some better ways to do things uh, and, and save our soil, uh, build our soil, regenerate our soil, uh, help that water infiltration. And I'll, I'll show you the milestones as we go through it. But, you know, when I started this process, I, I never could have projected uh, where I'd be today. Uh, it's been a fast uh, journey, a very broad journey that, that I've traveled on, but I think it's been a very worthwhile journey. Um, you know, Jessica always says I'm outstanding in my field, and uh, this is the, really the way that I perceive uh, how I, I'm outstanding in my field is just looking at what we've done and where we can go next, uh, enjoying the crop uh, while it's there. Uh, and, you know, just what we've learned, uh, sometimes it just takes a little reflection uh, to get out in Mother Nature and, and understand why we're doing this. I, th I think that's really important is knowing the why. This is uh, the first field day that I ever had. This is one of the first cover crops that I ever planted in 2011. Uh, in a very big drought like we're in right now. We're in a D4 drought like a lot of you are in uh, western Kansas, eastern Colorado, straight up through here in Oklahoma and Texas Panhandle. Um, 
and we learned so much the first year. Uh, I had to prove to myself about cover crops. Uh, would they work in an arid environment? Uh, would they use water? Would they use too much water? You know, what would be the benefits? So we had probes in the ground. We could track everything. We knew where it was at. And the first year, we learned that, see that square? The next year, the impact that the cover crops had and the bare soil was barely surviving the next year. And what we learned from that was where we had uh, no cover crop, we had only 16 inches of moisture in the profile in that square. But outside that square where the growing wheat was growing, we had 33 inches of water in the profile uh, and it just blew us away. And we knew then that we were onto something and we started really accelerating uh, from there. And, and just like Todd Tobin was talking about, man, on the farm data, you, you cannot replace that. Side by side trials is how we really learn and how we accelerate as we went through this process. We quickly learned if we kept it covered, one of the principles, and we kept a living root in the ground. Another principle on a 100 degree day, this was a little over 100 degrees, we're 80 degrees uh, in that soil. That that allows your biology, as Jess was talking about a little bit ago, survive and work for you for free. If you feed them and you keep them covered, they will work free for you to free up nutrients that you can grow crops. If you keep it bare on a 100 degree day, you're almost at 130, 129 degrees. Uh, and that fries everybody. Uh, you and I would not like to work in 130 degree weather. We cannot survive in that weather very long. And that's where our soil biology is. So we started to really learning more about biology and how we could grow and how we could enhance it uh, for the future. Then after a few years uh, in our process, in our growth and in our learning, uh, one morning I went down we had a rainfall event over the night. I had a sprinkler. I've got a couple of these uh, that was still running. We had two and a half inches of rain and I was putting on an inch and a half with this pass. And when I got down there, I was just really uh, overjoyed and astounded that I had no standing water and no runoff water uh, with that much being applied uh, through the night. And it was just a real eye-opening that I was on the right track that my water infiltration rates were going up my carbon was going up uh, and we were really starting to accelerate our, our process and this was about year five and six uh, into this journey and so with that that energized me to bring in the team uh, there on the right is the, my soil scientist currently Steve's getting ready to retire Steve Osvald NRCS uh, the gentleman in the red next to him with the hat on, everybody knows Greg Scott, the former state soil scientist for NRCS, now with the Conservation Commission. Uh, to my intermediate left is uh, Amy Seeger. She's also a soil scientist. And then we have Macy Hammock at that time, which is now married, but she is uh, going to do the photography for us that day. And what we were gonna to try to do is really test our water infiltration rates. And uh, so we parked the pivot where it couldn't move and we turned it on. And we set up GoPro cameras on the sprinkler, around the sprinkler, and that's a four foot wagon wheel ring that we drove into the ground. And uh, we just let it run for about an hour and 40 minutes till we had uh, seven inches of water out uh, overran the gauge, and as soon as I shut the pivot off, uh, guess what happened? There's no standing water. It, it all went in. And uh, that really energized me again to know that we could take that kind of rainfall event in an hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes, uh, and take it all in. And uh, it was a real opener to the team, uh, what we had been able to accomplish in that amount of time. And uh, as they were digging that day, they were trying to find out how deep it went and how quickly it went. Uh, it went down about five foot uh, in the next hour and a half. Uh, and as they were digging, then we discovered the new 
uh, unexpected uh, for me, uh, un unexpected thing that happened. This is my new topsoil on the left and what it used to look like on the right. Now on the right, you can see some darkening starting to mix in that. That's the earthworms as they're moving that, that profile down. Uh, and my soil scientist said, oh my gosh, uh, Jimmy, you have not only regenerated your soil, rebuilt your soil, uh, we think that you have changed the classification of your soil. And uh, that, that caught me off guard and uh, really surprised me. And what that really meant was that original soil survey was mapped as a used to flu vent. And uh, it was a very young soil, about 500 years old, and it didn't have a very dark surface. And uh, now we're eight years into the, the 13 year journey. And Steve said, uh, I didn't see that eight years ago. It was, you know, a light soil. Today, I see a dark soil we call a molly. Uh, which now we can reclassify that into a fluventic half the soil. And, and uh, that, I, I know that's happening across the country in lots of, of producers' farms, uh, and they haven't realized that, or their NRCS or their agronomist hasn't uh, found that out yet, or really looked at it. You know, and we didn't think that was even possible uh, when we started this down the road, and that really wasn't our target. You know, that was a, a consequence that happened as we applied the five principles of soil health uh, into that system. Then that started the journey uh, more for me. Uh, shortly after that, I was appointed by the Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue. Uh, I served him for two and a half years, uh, had five states. I came back home after that administration left. I went to work for the Oklahoma Conservation Commission for a couple of years, uh, working with General Mills and putting mentoring uh, on the ground with farmers, ranchers. Then I had this opportunity uh, just a few months ago, a couple of months ago, actually, uh, to go to work for Farm Journal and their trust in food as a senior vice president of Climate Smart Programs. Uh, then I'm also in charge of trust in beef and uh, ag, uh, America's conservation ag movement. Um, it really uh, gives us another platform uh, nationwide. Uh, Farm Journal's 148 years old uh, and has grown into a massive company, uh, multiple magazines, uh, television, podcast, uh, radio. I mean, it, it's, it's everywhere. And Trust in Food is the new initiative from them that really puts uh, trying to connect producers across the country to regenerative ag and, and start working in this climate smart uh, arena. And uh, that we want to talk about a little bit of that today, Jess and I. Uh, I just had a few slides here to kind of show the journey. And uh, now I want to bring Jess in and have a conversation about, yeah. you know, why do we do this and, and how are we going to do this and why uh, are we worried about the climate? Yeah, I I think uh, that's a good way to kind of get things kickstarted. And one question that I had from you, Jimmy, is, um, you know, we you, you've done a lot in the soil health space. Do you think that producers that are getting into the entry point of changing practices today, are they at an advantage compared to where you were, you know, 13 plus years ago? And what are some things that you've seen change that are gonna help propel producers into this? Well, I'm much like Dave Brandt. When Dave Brandt started 30 years ago, there was no one and there was no uh, social media. There was no podcast like we have today, webinars out there. When I started, it was just beginning to, to go down that journey. And, you know, I didn't have anyone around me uh, to, to work with. And I quickly learned that social media and that mentoring network uh, could really help me. And, you know, advanced that 13, 14 years now, it is in every publication that you see, uh, multiple podcasts that you can see daily, webinars, 
uh, it's almost in front of everyone. And so that has really changed over the last 30, 40 years from no one to, to you cannot look anywhere today and not see regenerative ag, soil health, climate smart, all that terminology that really will help us get to the next level. So it's a big I, advantage. I agree with that. I went to my first commodity classic and I've said this several times. If you had told me that that uh, event was not focused on soil health, I wouldn't have known any better because everywhere I went at the event this year in Orlando did focus on soil health. It was on the main stage and it was on um, such a good majority of people, uh, businesses, young, old, new, um, are talking about this. And that's my greatest hope. And I know that is yours too. So let me just ask, I want to ask a few more uh, questions about your production, but and then and then we'll kind of transition over when you first made these changes, I mean, you just didn't wake up one day and thought, you know, I think I'm going to add some cover, I'm pay some more money, add some cover crops, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. So what happened in the operation to where you thought about something and it turned into an action? Was there a, you know, this is my favorite question to ask. Was there a crisis? What happened? So uh, we had started no-tilling in 1995. And I really didn't start down this journey till 2010 uh, when I heard David Brandt talk about what he'd been doing in Ohio. I, at that point in my career, no-till was not working very well for me here because I was at that I'm also a rancher and I was on this take all mentality. Uh, you know, if I was going to graze something, uh, I grazed it and I grazed it hard and, and uh, took out everything. Uh, out of that you know and, and if I wanted my soil bare and clean because I didn't want a weed growing but that started to really uh, not working very well because I wasn't leaving the residue out there in the cover and my ground was starting to shut down on me uh, and I knew I had to do something and so when I heard David talk I come back home and I thought about it you know and, and of course at that time I was thinking the cover crop is going to take too much water we're, we're in that arid environment, very fragile, uh, but I wanted to try it. And so then I reached out to several of my partners, NRCS, the conservation districts and the commission, Noble Research, and asked them if I would donate uh, my farm to be a kind of a research gathering farm for all of us. Uh, would they help me gather data, good or bad? However it turned out, I was willing to accept that. And so we went down that journey, and that's kind of what I was showing you there uh, in them pictures was all my partners, uh, Noble Research, NRCS, the conservation districts, uh, really paid a really important role in that. Uh, so I knew that, you know, you got to surround yourself with good people and intelligent people to help you. And then I knew if I wanted to talk about this and share this out, and try to get my neighbors and friends and other people across the state to work on that, I had to have the data. And so that on-farm research side to side has really helped us out. So that's kind of how I got started, Jess. It was it was a, a kind of a vision, but it was also a time of I had to change. I, I just had to change because the farm wasn't going to work the way I thought. And uh, my dad had passed away. My granddad had passed away. Uh, in that time from 95 to 10. And uh, I knew that I had to change and I didn't want the farm to fail. Yeah, we, uh, Todd Tobin really highlighted a lot of that same message of just being open to learning new things and whether or not that's a common uh, mentality in agriculture, I'm finding it just, it just kind of depends on where you're at. But a couple of things I'll highlight there is that peer-to-peer -peer network um, and then Jeff put in the comments here about uh, doing test plots and show me, you know, we're, we're a type of people where show me what you can do. And I'm more than, more than willing to kind of kickstart things on my own operation. So Jimmy, you've been an inspiration to many. Thank you for always being open and willing to talk and thanks for joining this call. So another reason why I wanted to talk to Jimmy is because, um, there is a change happening in agriculture, and um, it has been uh, accelerated by those pioneers. 
and, and those uh, people that have had traditional knowledge to regenerate our soil. And so um, in the last couple of years, a new initiative has come out called Climate Smart Commodities. And uh, Brandon kind of introduced the concept of where we were going with it. And you had a, a more particular aspect of what you're working on with Climate Smart Commodities. So let's just introduce the topic. Let's go from there. And I think I think you had a few more slides here. So feel free to get after it. And, and I'll just tape. Uh, folks, put the put questions in the chat, and you know uh, Jimmy and I are more than welcome to hop on here and and uh, get things going on uh, making this a conversation. So take it away, Jimmy. So uh, you know, with this new job at Farm and Farm Journal and Trust in Food, we also have a forty million dollar uh, commodity smart grant that we're going to put on the ground uh, in fifteen states. Uh, about $17 million is going to producers uh, in them states. Uh, so I'm going to be working up through uh, uh, from here north uh, to start with this summer uh, in the ranching sector uh, with that. And uh, everybody asks, you know, why is this uh, so important now? And what is climate smart? And why uh, should I care? And, and why should I participate? Uh, and it all comes down to the supply chain, the food chain, and uh, what EPA has set out uh, for greenhouse emissions uh, and, and how that footprint from the, the processors and the sellers of food uh, have to deal with. And so it, it comes down, you know, if we practice all these principles that Jess laid out, you know, don't fight mother nature, keep it covered. Uh, you know, minimize that disturbance. If you do all these practices in soil health, uh, it starts helping uh, with them emissions. But, you know, what does that really mean? Uh, and it's things that you have that are not in your control. Uh, you know, you can't help actions of others. You can't help the past opinions. You know, what do people think about what I do on my farm? You know, I really don't care. I, I want to manage myself. So, but what I have in control is my thoughts and my actions, what I can give my energy to, uh, how I speak to myself uh, when I'm out standing in that field. You know, am I doing right? Has everything I've tried worked? No. Uh, you know, a lot of times I say, hell no. Uh, but I learn from that because it's a learning opportunity. And that's the goals that I set how I spend my free time, how I handle my challenges, my boundaries. And then what does that really mean to climate smart? Well, it comes down to the scope uh, emissions that we want to talk about, Jess, and I want to talk about this, scope two and scope three. And, you know, what does that mean for Jimmy on his farm? Uh, who does that affect? And what is the real definition of that? And I know a lot of you haven't heard about some of this, but it's like, if you're a, uh, I'm gonna throw out a, a major company, if you're a McDonald's and you're selling beef at the number one largest uh, consumer uh, hamburger place joint in town across the country, across the globe, their biggest carbon footprint is in the sourcing shed. It's a uh, 75% uh, is really out on the ranch. And what does that mean? That, Scope two is emissions that are indirect emissions from a generation of produced energy. So that's the fuel we burn, the fertilizer we use, the chemicals we use, that all gives emissions off as we apply that. Uh, and scope three that really is uh, on the farm and ranch is emissions that are uh, the result of activities from assets not owned or controlled by the reporting company, say like a McDonald's. So they have to report their emissions as a total company. Uh, and as they do that, they, they only have control back where they buy the meat from. But actually the, it, it, it's the footprint from, you know, birth to box, so to speak in the cattle industry. And uh, this is why. So if they're gonna to try to reduce their uh, carbon footprint, their emissions as a company that they have to meet goals by 2030 with EPA. Uh, how are they going to do that? And uh, that's where Climate Smart 
uh, agriculture term came from. Uh, and so, you know, how does that affect us on the farm and ranch? Uh, well, we can do nothing uh, and continue just like we've been doing. But what's going to happen is these companies are going to be forced to uh, try to reduce their emissions so we don't affect the climate anymore uh, as harshly as we've been doing. So they're going to start putting out uh, millions of dollars. That's where the commodity grants started from. Uh, that process that USDA put out a huge invest, investment by the government uh, to really start helping farmers and ranchers uh, and foresters and everybody understand, you know, if you apply them principles and you start down this journey, we will be uh, using climate smart agriculture to our advantage uh, and we will have a product then that the food companies, uh, whether it's grain, meats, whatever, uh, uh, then can start reducing their footprint. And uh, maybe we can calm this weather, this whiplash weather down uh, that we're seeing, you know, unprecedented uh, storm in Florida, a thousand year rain, 25.9 inches in, in 12 hours. I mean, uh, you know, it's just really, really uh, extreme weather events that we're going down. Uh, you know, and, and what we can do is just, the David Brandt talks about this today, you know, you can't force someone to hear a message that, that they don't wanna hear or are ready to receive. Uh, and, and a lot of people don't wanna talk about climate change and the weather, you know, and who's, who's causing it, uh, but it's happening. And uh, we, you know, we just got to, uh, never underestimate the power of a seed uh, and, and cover crops and what we do on the ground to really help us. And, you know, I've, I think I've kind of proved that on the farm uh, pretty successfully in an arid environment. A lot of people are asking me right now, you know, what are you doing, Jimmy, on the farm and ranch? Well, we're in survival mode right now with this, this big drought. It's worse than 11 and 12 was for us. Uh, we've had several crops fail, and I've always said in my talks, if you've ever heard me uh, talk somewhere, if it never rains, it doesn't matter what you do. Uh, we lasted quite a while before we exhausted uh, our profile out. We, we went further than I think some of my neighbors did, uh, and so I think that's a testimony to how we do that, but, you know, it's, it's understanding that climate smart, Jess, that we've really got to understand. And I think there'll be some pretty nice premiums as we go down the road here uh, in the early sets. Uh, but now also keep in mind, every time we have a premium, uh, there comes a discount on the other side. And so in the future, uh, if you're not lessening your in, you know, that footprint, uh, I think there's going to be a, a deficit on that side you know uh, we can have a premium on one side but then we also have to worry about the other side so I think that's important that we look at yeah I think that's really important to take a look at too and I think that's such a timely conversation with the volatile markets that we have with inputs and you know um, Dale Strickler did a really good job last week of just kind of defining what is climate change and I said at the beginning of the call that it is a topic that we have tend to shy away from in the agricultural industry. Um, and we don't desire fingers pointed at us, but it's like Ron Seelock said up here in the comments, and thanks for joining us every week, Ron. We notice that you've been here every time. You know, he just, he puts out the, the plea, you know, if we don't change the way we're doing agriculture, all of agriculture and make it more regenerative and promote us from within, from the ground level, from the boots on the ground, then we could perhaps be regulated into doing something that may or may not be best for our operation. So very timely conversation, Jimmy. I mean, I mean, hopefully it's not too late. <laughs> no, it's, it's never too late to, to try to change. And, you know, when we talk about the word change uh, and, and we hear this a lot, producers, farmers don't want to change. That is not true. That is not true because if we didn't want to change, we would still be using a hoe and a shovel to put seeds in the ground instead of horses that went into mules, that went into tractors, that went into technology, went into, uh, you know, high technology, auto steer, 
precision ag. Uh, so farmers and ranchers have been changing all the time and they have adapted and learned. And now is the time to really ramp up that game and, and get to the next level. And I think that's really important, Jess, to think about that at your operation when you think, well, I don't know if I want to embrace this or try this. Just think where your great granddad was and where you're at. And you've been changing all along as well. So just take it to the next level. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think um, that's why we're seeing such beneficial things coming into the atmosphere of agriculture. And, you know, this call is sponsored by Prairie Food and we, we, we are a small but mighty company that's trying to get things done. But what we, what I think that our leaders and our company have done a really great job with is assembling people that can, that can do that peer mentorship with our Green, green Glove service. Um, Mark Hines, who we're going to talk to next week and Jamie and Dr. Trisha Jackson, um, who's on here and so many people on this teeny tiny team that's just trying to make such a big impact in agriculture. And I, I think we're at a place where I hope that the history books, when we look back upon um, the way that we have done agriculture for civilization, that we say, you know what, there is this time where people rose up and um, accelerated a movement and uh, we got in there and figured it out. You know, we did the things that we need to do at the ground level. We're, we're hoping to, with these climate smart initiatives, to cocoon some of our other organizations and industries and universities to join us. So that's really what we're asking for. So I'll let you keep going on your slides here, Jimmy. I think you had a few more. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, one thing I want to point out with prairie food, it's so important that, that we feed the biology and we put out amendments that can accelerate that, you know, and I, I've used prairie food with, with pretty nice results out of that. It's all about growing soil organic matter so that we can take them big grains in uh, like I've built here. Because uh, we know when this drought ends or during this drought, we're going to have them extremes and it's going to dump out in a local uh, rain event, a massive amount of water. It, it always has. In the 30s, everybody wants to talk about the, the dust bowl in Oklahoma, and it's documented, we lost more soil to water erosion during that time period than we did to dust uh, because it was so fragile when we did get rains, it eroded away at enormous rate. And so we learned from that. And that's what I'm trying to say. We've really learned from that. And we've done a lot better job uh, since the 30s and the 50s here. Uh, and it's, it's, it's about keeping the, the ground covered but it's also getting out in the field and, and managing a cover crop like you would manage a cash crop uh, because it is going to turn your next cash crop into cash. And you're going to have to have the water to do that. You're going to have to have the nutrients to do that. And how do we do that with less inputs? And, you know, it's all about activating the biology to do that. And, we see this all across the country in an arid environment or in a very, you know, I've worked with people with six inch rainfall and some in Florida uh, at 60 inches. Uh, and it works everywhere if you apply the principles and understand the system. And it's really like this, just getting out in the field with a shovel, looking at a plant and thinking, why did I plant this buckwheat here? And it's to free up phosphorus. Why do I plant a lagoon? It's to help put nitrogen in the ground. So as you build that cover crop, build it uh, in that species and that mix to help you with your next cash crop. And then of course I use animals, I graze that as well. So, you know, when I'm out in the field, this is things that I'm thinking about. It's, it's not just get some seed and throw it out there and say, I've got a cover crop. Uh, you know, will, will somebody help me with the cost of that? It is using that to maximize the return for the next crop and how you grow and build soil. And uh, that's with this cover crop. And, and I'm going to kind of end there, uh, Jess, so we can have a conversation and answer questions there. Uh, but, you know, long live the soil. And it has to because our lives depend on it. And uh, uh, I truly believe that, uh, that that's what we've got to do. And so, uh, you know, I want to uh, to get out of that and uh, to really take care of our soil. I'm trying to get out of stop sharing here. Just hang on a minute. 
<laughs> That's okay. No, and if anybody, uh, we'll stick this information in the chat too, so that everybody has it. And um, folks, this is the time in the call where if you would like to ask a question, please get get it in the chat. Or and um, we also like to have the ability to to see you. So if you have the ability to turn on your camera right now, um, feel free to. And let's go ahead and ask some questions to Jimmy. Jimmy, um, one question: You uh, gave a presentation at the Prairie Food Forum. Uh, last year in 2021. And one of the questions was, uh, you made a statement about how much rain did you get? Why get it all? And I know you've already talked a little bit about how that works on your farm. We've had other speakers talk about opening up those poor spaces. Um, but how has your mentality changed in terms of rainfall on, on the total uh, farm? And this is a hard topic being in a D, D4 drought. I mean, are, is, is this what's going to get you through? Yeah, it, it really is. And, and the key to that is just think about when I come up with that phrase, you know, when it rains, I get it all. That's my that's my goal. And uh, I want it all because I need it all uh, when it does come. And, and, and right now we're fully exhausted out. There's no moisture uh, to grow anything on. Uh, but that puts me if I have that aggregation and I fed the biology and it's shutting down now with lack of moisture, but it's not going anywhere. They're just going to shut down. And uh, when that rain starts happening, let's get it in. And the eye opener for me was where I was keeping it bare and I had all them probes out and moisture. I started showing that I had more water to work with. That aggregation is so important. And my sprinklers, my irrigation became very efficient because they were only used to supplement uh, rain up until we get into a drought like this, and then it comes the primary. But I'm just telling you, irrigation water, especially in my area, is not rainwater. Uh, it gets very hard, and it's and we can't put out large amounts like uh, you can in a, in an aquifer that's really good, like the Ogallala. So uh, we have to watch that. So it's it's that being to build that profile in soil that takes this big weather event in because it may be a long time till the next rain comes and then you have something to grow with. So used to, when they when they said we had a two inch rain, my infiltration rates were a half inch an hour. Uh, so did I get two inches? No, I did not. Uh, that, and that's what really helped me just to understand that. Yeah, and I don't know if Scott is on the call here, but he um, works uh, in Kansas here and one of, a comment he had put in the in the chat was just talking to farmers to send him infiltration, organic matter, and aggregate study. Um, he he needs this information because he thinks that we need to show this information on the improvement of soils hydrolog hydrologic function, and this will help FEMA when they're working in a watershed and working on broad projects. Um, to, to take an approach that would reduce peak flow and flooding for communities downstream. I mean, that's exactly why this is so important. If the carbon goes away, um, FEMA might be able to step in. So Scott, did I, did I get your question? Was there more you wanted to add there to that or point of clarity? And he hasn't turned you on. You know, that's. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Scott. We see you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, Jess. Good to see you again. And Jimmy, it's great to see you. Uh, I guess the, the biggest thing we're really having a question about is how do we communicate this to the communities? Because it's been so ingrained in the farmer, which is needs needs to be in the in the um, agricultural world. We've got to start having people outside of the agricultural world look at us, look at the agricultural regenerative ag as a solution to some of their local ecosystem service. And one of the things that I think is gonna come up is if you go into a community and start talking about carbon credits, that's really all on the farmer's side, but what do they get out of it? And one of the things that I've been doing is working with our hazard mitigation plan. And I do have a question for you too. Um, and they've already accepted the draft. So for flooding, but they want me to draft something for drought. Now, remember, FEMA only goes to communities that write 
a request for funds under the hazard mitigation plan. So how do we how do we instill in them how they can provide get the funding to distribute to their watershed regenerative ag folks or however you want to put that. This is really going to be a big topic coming down the road because FEMA is starting to look outside of the normal mitigation practice. Now they're starting to look at natural based solutions. Well, nature-based solutions don't always have to be a wetland or a buffer around the community. In fact, they might be better if they go up into the watershed and start working with more of those landowners. So the the second question was, Jimmy, how do you think we can organize a group of producers? This is going to, have to be a mass balance, a group of producers or a group of land managers that we can get around this whole uh, scenario so that we can show them that as a collaborative group, they can really make a difference in that. So on the first question, as we talk about carbon in it, you know, it's a it's a big uh, chatterbox right now. Of, you know, how can I, you know, capture carbon? How can I market that? Uh, and and that market just really developing. It's it's not here yet. It's here, yeah. but it's not here yet on the 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 demand side that that we need to really have a good market and mm -hmm. and i keep telling everybody you know uh you can take a few dollars an acre uh there and, and use that to to better yourself and and to put more cover crops, better grazing management out uh and but it's just not going to go far enough quite truthfully and uh you know you've been on my place uh you you've been working in this scope i've worked with several uh trying to get fema trying to get uh, uh the big corps of engineers to understand uh as we rebuild soils we flatten out the extreme flooding and flatten out the extreme drought it, it's still going to have that wave in it because right now mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in the wave that i'm out of water yeah i, I went as far as i can go uh, so you know data everybody wants data as as we go forward and you know you and i've talked about this and we've tried to get uh the federal government to put dollars into a watershed uh and pick a size of watershed out if i don't care and fully fund that uh to help producers put practices on the ground uh with enough revenue and then you know research that project from start to finish and really show what we can do and it's got to be a big enough project a long enough time frame that we can show the benefits we can show good benefits on soil good soil uh, with cover crops and then five principles and knowing your context at, at a quick rate on ranch land it's slower and and the drier you are the slower it mm -hmm. is if that mm -hmm. doesn't mean you can't do it uh, but that's things that you got to watch in, in that slow process. And that's really the, the climate smart grants are really good about putting a large chunk of money out. The, the problem is that they've got a short window. Yep. Uh, I'm three and a half years. And then they want to see progress in three and a half years. And the real truth is we're just going to be getting started at three and right. a half years mm -hmm. and yeah. seeing incremental uh, steps forward. Uh, you know, we didn't destroy this soil in one or two or three years. Right. We've destroyed this soil since the, the first plow wow. and the first overgrazing started happening from the prairie. So why should we expect this to turn around in two or three years? But we're going to need the data to really help FEMA to help the Corps of Engineers and the Corps and FEMA are starting to notice uh, that we can make a change, uh, but it's a slow process and everybody wants immediate uh, process, Scott, and we're just not going to get there immediately. And I want to add something to that because I, we've done a lot of pros and cons about climate smart commodity projects within Prairie Food, and we're a part of one. Um, we're, we're able to be a partner um, in a project. Um, the fact that it's a pilot is something that is kind of on the back of my mind. 
And we need this data, but most importantly to Scott and Jimmy is we need information. You've, we, we're going to get all this data. My hope is that by doing these projects and like Jimmy said, think the biology might just be getting kickstarted after year three. It might take year five, but please, I hope that we are getting information back to communities, back to exactly what you're talking about here, Scott, um, so that community members, municipalities, cities can make good decisions. That's one thing I'm, I've yet to have a great understanding on whether or not this project will drive information to where it needs to go. So, and I have a couple ideas for you, Scott. I'll have to talk to you offline, but I have a couple ideas in the back of my mind of how we could work together on that. All right, good. Well, thanks for your time. Yeah, Keep I'll up the good work, Jimmy. On, uh, I, I will. I'm, I'm yeah, pedal on the floor fast as I can go and all the hats I can juggle. Uh, <laughs> but you know, the, the American, one thing that we haven't talked about today is the American consumer is really starting to demand to know where their food comes from and, and is it you know high chemical use high fertilizer use yeah. are my animals being taken well care of and as that market develops and it is developing uh we're going to have to answer that and so let's get started now and, and start working towards we can tell a story and regenerative ag mm -hmm. is a story and it is a journey uh, and use products like prairie food and other products out there that can get you there instead of a chemical. Yeah, and I think I've always kind of said that I've been very fortunate because I turned that exact scenario into my life's work. You know, I had a question about food 12 years ago. I held some misconceptions about food, and I definitely understand that uh, I had a great opportunity to just jump in head first because I'm a, a Kansas woman, you know, I've got agriculture all around me. So it wasn't that hard for me to get out there and ask questions to producers like yourself on, well, wait, why do we do things this way? And why are we using this chemical? Why are we not using that chemical? And like I said, I had to undo some of my own personal misconceptions about farming and agriculture. And what it led me to is uh, is is this ability for us to regenerate soil. So we have a couple more questions in here. We had a questions about crop rotation. And I think that uh, Rob Harrington, um, feel free to hop in here, Rob. Are you on the line? Just uh, where you at? There you go. Yeah, no, um, just wonderful. Uh, yeah, I do have a comment. I, I I see Mike Beans on the line also, or his group is as well. And and I kind of come at this from outside. I'm one. I'm the co-founder of Prairie Food, and come from the high tech area, but grew up in in Western Kansas, all around ag. Always wanted to be a farmer, but I was one of those darn city kids. Um, the the thing that that intrigues me is the relationship between carbon and water. And I think one of the advantages we have at this point in time, because Jimmy hit the nail on the head, if you don't have water, it doesn't matter what else you do, you do nothing's gonna, nothing's gonna happen. But if you have sufficient carbon in the soil, when that water comes, you store it, you get it, you keep it. And what I've looked at across the state of Kansas, and I've talked to several of the legislators and, and to Mike about, is we don't have a good mechanism of teaching people the value of soil health and carbon. And what would be nice, I mean, they already do uh, SOM numbers as a baseline across the state, I think being be able, being able to have a baseline number that relates to carbon and water storage across the state. So someone can look at their neighbor and go, oh, he's storing twice as much water as I am. Gee, what can I do to help store water myself? And I think it would be a wonderful project for an NCRS or, or whoever in conjunction with states in order to give a, a, a method of measurement to find out where I stand in this in this prospect of keeping my water there. Yeah, that's that's so true, Rob. Uh, and one of the things, and I bring this up quite a bit in my talks, is thinking about carbon. Uh, it helps your water holding capacity. Most of us 
have, have depleted that carbon out. Uh, and so think about that, what that does to aquifers. You know, we hear of a lot of aquifers with high phosphorus, high nitrates in it. Yep. You know, the reason that is, is because of carbon, the natural filtering system that was here has been depleted. And so right. that allows them nutrients to move on down uh, with the water. Uh, and so it's a very important part of all of our lives. And, you know, as we look in human health as well in that arena, uh, it, it really coincides where we went on the chemical side of soil. You know, we take a soil test traditionally uh, and we make a chemical recommendation to fix a problem. Uh, a doctor pulls blood and makes a chemical recommendation with a pill or medicine to fix an issue. And what we're learning is all the side effects of that fix uh, is back to eating healthy foods from healthy soils that's mm -hmm. grown and has all the nutrients in it. And so we've got to get both of them parties that are on this trajectory. Uh, that is not the way that we're going to be healthy. And that's not the way our soil is going to be healthy to have healthy plants uh, down the road. And it's all back to the carbon is the total key. And how do we build that? And how do we uh, store that? And how does that help us hold water as long as we can and go in these droughts as far as we can? But yet, when the drought's over and we get 10, 20 inches, can we take all that in? Maybe not take 25 inches in. But what if we could take 10 or 15 of that? Uh, then what's the flood look like? And that right. goes back to Scott's comments. How do we get uh, big government to think about that instead of investing in uh, national disasters, uh, big flooding events like in Florida right now? How do we invest early on to lessen that impact down the road? Well, you well, well, very well said, Jimmy. And and one other thing about bringing big government in, like FEMA, they really define uh, the waterways and floodways by navigable waterways. Now, the great news is the Sappy Creek in Colby, Kansas, is a navigable waterway. I've never seen an ounce of water in it since I was born. So there is an opportunity if a city or whatever would make a request, even though they're not on a flowing river, there's a good chance that uh, they would get a response and potentially some sort of funding in there. Yeah, I think this is exactly what we're seeing municipalities take a look at stuff like this by developing um, like climate action plans. And so, Rob, I think your suggestion is really, I, I'm seeing lots of comments and I'm getting some messages offline where people really like this idea to see if we can't uh, get NRCS to take a look at what are what some ideas that we have through the Dynamic Soil Property Program. Um, awesome. Because I said this earlier, we're doing this three-year pilot. We're spending $3.2 billion. The government's putting a lot out there and we're doing a robust monitoring and verification. And Jimmy, we didn't even, we didn't even get started talking about monitoring and verifying. Um, and we had some questions about how do we know for regenerative. My greatest hope is that we get the information that we need, we get the data and we turn it into social change. I mean, that's that's really what we need to have happen here. And so some of these items that we're discussing today, I think are will accelerate that. So um, Rob, thank you so much for always supporting uh, regenerative farmers. And I wouldn't know for a minute that you weren't a farm boy when, <laughs> when you get up and talk, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have known that. <laughs> I can drive a combine. <laughs> right, that's right. All right. So, um, Jimmy, we did have another question um, about your cover crop blends, but but I think maybe we'll we'll call that the last question, and um, maybe give everybody back the rest of their lunch hour. And it's a beautiful day outside. But I think the question was, could you just talk a little bit about how you developed cover crop blends and how they have changed um, over the years? Yeah, and I tried to address that with that kneeling picture out there in the field. Uh, to start with, I, I went by recommendations, you know, balance your carbon to nitrogen ratio about 25 to one in that mix. 
uh, and I started. But then as I started down that road, I started targeting Asia and my carbon. You got to keep that in balance because it's, remember, it's carbon is key. Uh, but then if I grew a bean crop, I knew I had to grow a high carbon crop behind it or a high carbon uh, cover crop behind that to replace the carbon that that legume took out of that. Uh, so then you start planting, mixing your mix uh, with a higher carbon ratio that way. And if you're in a corn crop and you're going to go back uh, out into something, you have a high carbon in your soil, in your biomass, then you're going to have to have a less higher carbon uh, in your cover crop. So then start toning in and zeroing in on your next crop. What do I need my microbes to free up for me? And what kind of cover crop can I feed them with that will help me achieve that goal? And as far as rotation, Alan, uh, I'm going to try to be on a four-year rotation. Dr. Randy Anderson really proved uh, weed management is best achieved at least in a four-year rotation. That means I, if I planted corn this year, it's four more years, the fifth year out here before I put corn back. And so I've really got a diverse rotation that's now on hold here during the drought. And then I will see when the rain comes and then what I can plant. And that's the window uh, that we look at is, all right, I've got so many growing days left in the year. What kind of crop can I fit in that window with the moisture that I have? And if I want to plant a cover crop for the next year, how do I target that? And, and, you know, what's the goal out of that? And like I said, manage that cover crop like you would manage your cash crop and, and fine tune that. We know when we plant corn, beans, wheat, we know everything that, that we want to use uh, in that to achieve that maximum goal. Do the same thing. Maximize that cover crop to the to your goal. If I'm planting a, a crop that's gonna need a lot of nitrogen, how do I feed that biology with prairie food and other amendments that I can use to really grow as much nitrogen in the ground that I can not have to buy for the future. So it's all that balancing act uh, and, and treat it like a cash crop. And, and that rotation, you got to get it wide enough that you're managing your weeds uh, and they don't know what you're going to grow next. And so you don't facilitate uh, like a palmer amaret with a, uh, in soybeans or cotton or whatever, it's screaming that it's consumed all the carbon. Now I can thrive and they love to thrive on nitrates. And so you, you just, if you keep planting cotton or keep planting beans on that, you just facilitate that worse and worse and worse. And so go to a, a different crop that will choke that out and put that carbon back in. I know that's a long-winded explanation, but it's, uh, it's how you got to look at it. Yeah, thank you. All right, well, thank and you. Yes, so I do. I, I am going to have to... Uh, leave here pretty quick. I've got a, a funeral to go to of a, a friend of mine. So uh, it's right. one of them deals you don't want to, but you have to. That's right. Well, yeah. we're sorry to hear about your loss, Jimmy. And thank you so much for being on this call with us. And uh, to everybody else on the call, we'll see you next week. We have two more Encore Farmer Friday events that are going to happen for the next two weeks. And then we'll see you back this summer. Long live the soil. I've got my tattoo. Already, it's going to full sleeve, <laughs> long live the soil with your face right on it, Jimmy. <laughs> awesome. I appreciate y'all. Thanks. Thank you, Jimmy. Okay, we'll see you guys later. Thanks, Bye. Rob.